This evening we have two Thanksgiving tales from the turn of the 20th century. I'm Pat Tully of the Ketchikan Public Library, and this is Reading Aloud. So our first story is Two Thanksgiving Day Gentlemen by O. Henry. There is one day that is ours. There is one day then all we Americans who are not self-made go back to the old home to eat Salateris biscuits and marvel how much nearer to the porch the old pump looks than it used to. Bless the day. President Roosevelt gives it to us. We hear some talk of the Puritans, but don't just remember who they were. That we can lick them anyhow if they try and land again. Plymouth Rocks? Well, that sounds more familiar. Lots of us have had to come down to hens since the Turkey Trust got its work in. But somebody in Washington is leaking out advance information to them about these Thanksgiving proclamations. The big city east of the Cranberry Bogs has made Thanksgiving Day an institution. The last Thursday in November is the only day in the year on which it recognizes the part of America lying across the ferries. It is the one day that is purely American. Yes, a day of celebration exclusively American. And now for the story which is to prove to you that we have traditions on this side of the ocean that are becoming older at a much rapider rate than those of England are, thanks to our get up and enterprise. Stuffy Pete took his seat on the third bench to the right as you enter Union Square from the east at the walk opposite the fountain. Every Thanksgiving day for nine years he had taken his seat there promptly at one o'clock. For every time he had done so, things had happened to him. Charles Dickensy things that swelled his waistcoat above his heart and equally on the other side. But today, Stuffy Pete's appearance at the annual trysting place seemed to have been rather the result of habit than of yearly hunger, which, as the philanthropist seemed to think, afflicts the poor at such extended intervals. Certainly, Pete was not hungry. He had just come from a feast that had left him of his powers barely those of respiration and locomotion. His eyes were like two pale gooseberries firmly embedded in a swollen and gravy-smeared mask of putty. His breath came in short wheezes, a senatorial row of adipose tissue denied a fashionable set to his upturned coat collar. Buttons that had been sewed upon his clothes by kind salvation fingers a week before blew like popcorn, strewing the earth around him. Ragged he was, with a split shirt front open to the wishbone, but the November breeze, carrying fine snowflakes, brought him only a grateful coolness. For Stuffy Pete was overcharged with the caloric produced by a super bountiful dinner, beginning with oysters and ending with plum pudding and including, it seemed to him, all the roast turkey and baked potatoes and chicken salad and squash pie and ice cream in the world. Wherefore he sat, gorged, and gazed upon the world with after-dinner contempt. The meal had been an unexpected one. He was passing a red brick mansion near the beginning of Fifth Avenue, in which lived two old ladies of ancient family and a reverence for traditions. They even denied the existence of New York and believed that Thanksgiving Day was declared solely for Washington Square. One of their traditional habits was to station a servant at the postern gate with orders to admit the first hungry wayfarer that came along after the hour of noon had struck and banquet him to a finish. Stuffy Pete happened to pass by on his way to the park and the seneschals gathered him in and upheld the custom of the castle. After Stuffy Pete had gazed straight before him for ten minutes, he was conscious of a desire for a more varied field of vision. With a tremendous effort, he moved his head slowly to the left, and then his eyes bulged out fearfully and his breath ceased, and the rough shot ends of his short legs wriggled and rustled on the gravel. For the old gentleman was coming across Fourth Avenue toward his bench. Every Thanksgiving day for nine years, the old gentleman had come there and found Stuffy Pete on his bench. That was a thing that the old gentleman was trying to make a tradition of. 
every Thanksgiving day for nine years, he had found Stuffy there and had led him to a restaurant and watched him eat a big dinner. They do those things in England unconsciously, but this is a young country and nine years is not so bad. The old gentleman was a staunch American patriot and considered himself a pioneer in American tradition. In order to become picturesque, we must keep on doing one thing for a long time without ever letting it get away from us. Something like collecting the weekly dimes in industrial insurance or cleaning the streets. The old gentleman moved straight and stately toward the institution he was rearing. Truly the annual feeding of Stuffy Pete was nothing national in its character, such as the Magna Carta or jam for breakfast was in New England. But it was a step. It was almost futile. It showed at least that a custom was not impossible to ne America. The old gentleman was thin and tall and 60. He was dressed all in black and wore the old fashioned kind of glasses that won't stay on your nose. His hair was whiter and thinner than it had been last year, and he seemed to make more use of his big knobbly cane with the crooked handle. As his established benefactor came up, Stuffy wheezed and shuddered like some woman's over-fat pug when a street dog bristles up at him. He would have flown, but all the skill of Santo Dumont could not have separated him from his bench. Well had the myrmidons of the two old ladies done their work. Good morning, said the old gentleman. I am glad to perceive that the vicissitudes of another year have spared you to move in health about the beautiful world. For that blessing alone, this day of Thanksgiving is well proclaimed to each of us. If you will come with me, my man, I will provide you with a dinner that should make your physical being accord with the mental. That is what the old gentleman said every time, every Thanksgiving day for nine years. The words themselves almost formed an institution. Nothing could be compared with them except the Declaration of Independence. Always before, they had been music in Stuffy's ears. But now he looked up at the old gentleman's face with a tearful agony in his own. The fine snow almost sizzled when it fell upon his perspiring brow. But the old gentleman shivered a little and turned his back to the wind. Stuffy had always wondered why the old gentleman spoke his speech rather sadly. He did not know it was because he was wishing every time that he had a son to succeed him. A son who would come there after he was gone. A son who would stand proud and strong before some subsequent Stuffy and say, in memory of my father. Then it would be an institution. But the old gentleman had no relatives. He lived in rented rooms in one of the decayed old family brownstone mansions in one of the quiet streets east of the park. In the winter, he raised fuchsias in a little conservatory the size of a steamer trunk. In the spring, he walked in the Easter parade. In the summer, he lived at a farmhouse in the New Jersey hills and sat in a wicker armchair, speaking of a butterfly, the Ornithoptera amphicerius, that he hoped to find some day. In the autumn, he fed Stuffy a dinner. These were the old gentleman's occupations. Stuffy Pete looked up at him for more than half a minute, stewing and helpless in his own self-pity. The old gentleman's eyes were bright with the giving pleasure. His face was getting more lined each year, but his little black necktie was in as jaunty a bow as ever, and the linen was beautiful and white, and his gray mustache was curled carefully at the ends. And then Stuffy made a noise that sounded like peas bubbling in a pot. Speech was intended, and as the old gentleman had heard the sounds nine times before, he rightly construed them into Stuffy's old formula of acceptance. Thank you, sir. I'll go with you and much obliged. I'm very hungry, sir. The coma of repletion had not prevented from entering Stuffy's mind the conviction that he was the basis of an institution. His Thanksgiving appetite was not his own. It belonged by all sacred rites of established custom, if not by the actual statute of limitations to this kind old gentleman who had preempted it. True, America is free, but in order to establish tradition, someone must be a repetend, 
a repeating decimal. The heroes are not all heroes of steel and gold. See one here that wielded only weapons of iron, badly silvered, and tin. The old gentleman led his annual protege southward to the restaurant and to the table where the feast had always occurred. They were recognized. Here comes the old guy, said a waiter, that blows that same bum to, to a meal every Thanksgiving. The old gentleman sat across the table, glowing like a smoked pearl at his cornerstone of future and ancient tradition. The waiters heaped the table with holiday food, and Stuffy, with a sigh that was mistaken for hunger's expression, raised knife and fork and carved for himself a crown of imperishable bay. No more valiant hero ever fought his way through the ranks of an enemy. Turkey, chops, soups, vegetables, pies disappeared before him as fast as they could be served. Gorged nearly to the uttermost when he entered the restaurant, the smell of food almost caused him to lose his honor as a gentleman, but he rallied like a true knight. He saw the look of beneficent happiness on the old gentleman's face. A happier look than even the fuchsias and the ornithoptera amphiserius had ever brought to it, and he had not the heart to see it wane. In an hour, Stuffy leaned back with the battle won. Thank ye kindly, sir, he puffed like a leaky steam pipe. Thank ye kindly for a hearty meal. Then he arose heavily with glazed eyes and started toward the kitchen. A waiter turned him around like a top and pointed him toward the door. The old gentleman carefully counted out a dollar thirty in silver change, leaving three nickels for the waiter. They parted as they did each year at the door, the old gentleman going south, Stuffy north. Around the first corner, Stuffy turned and stood for one minute. Then he seemed to puff out his rags like an owl puffs out his feathers and fell to the sidewalk like a sun-stricken horse. When the ambulance came, the young surgeon and the driver cursed softly at his weight. There was no smell of whiskey to justify a transfer to the patrol wagon, so Stuffy and his two dinners went to the hospital. There they stretched him on a bed and began to test him for strange diseases, with the hope of getting a chance at some problem with the bare steel. And lo, an hour later, another ambulance brought the old gentleman, and they laid him on another bed and spoke of appendicitis, for he looked good for the bill. But pretty soon, one of the young doctors met one of the young nurses whose eyes he liked and stopped to chat with her about the cases. That nice old gentleman over there now, he said, you wouldn't think that it was a case of almost starvation. Proud old family, I guess. He told me he hadn't eaten a thing for three days. The end. Now, our second story is called Two Old Boys by Pauline Shackelford Collier. Day after tomorrow will be Thanksgiving, said Walter, taking his seat beside Grandpa Davis on the top step of the front gallery. And no turkey for dinner neither, retorted Grandma Davis, while her bright steel needles clicked in and out of the sock she was knitting. The old man was smoking his evening pipe and sat for a moment with his eyes fixed meditatively upon the blue hills massed in the distance. Have we got so poor as all that, mother? he asked after a while, glancing over his shoulder at his wife, who was rocking to and fro just back of him. I'm obliged to own the truth, answered the old lady dejectedly. What with the wild varmints in the wood and one thing or another, I'm about cleaned out of all the poultry I ever had. It's downright disheartening. Well then, asserted Grandpa Davis with an unmirthful chuckle, it don't appear to me as we've got so powerful much to be thankful about this year. Why, Grandpa, cried Walter in shocked surprise. I never did hear you talk like that before. Never had so much call to do it, maybe, interposed the old man cynically. The last rays of the setting sun touched the two silvered heads and rested there like a benediction before disappearing below the horizon. Silence had fallen upon the little group and a bullfrog down in the fish pond was croaking dismally. Why don't you go hunting and try to kill you a turkey for Thanksgiving, ventured Walter, slipping his arm insinuatingly through his grandfather's. 
I saw a great big flock of wild ones down on the branch last week, and I got right close up to them before they flew. I reckon there ought to be a right smart sight of game round and about them cane breaks along that branch, said the old man slowly, as though thinking aloud. It used to be ahead of any strip of woods in all these parts when me and Dick was boys. But nobody ain't hunted there, to my knowledge, not since me and him fell out. I wish you and Grandpa Dunn were friends, sighed Walter. It does seem too bad to have two grandpas living right side by side and not speaking. I ain't got no ill will in my heart for Dick, replied Grandpa Davis. But he is too everlasting hard-headed to knock under and I'll be blamed if I go more than halfway toward making up. That's just exactly what Grandpa Dunn says about you, Walter assured him very earnestly. Wouldn't wonder if he did, said the old man pointedly. Dick has always a, been mighty hand to talk, and he'd drop dead in his tracks if he couldn't get in the last word. Be this as it might, the breach had begun when the Davis cattle broke down the worm fence and demolished the Dunn crop of corn and it widened when the dun hogs found their way through an old water gap and rooted up a field of the Davis sweet potatoes. Several times similar depredations were repeated, and then shotguns were used on both sides with telling effect. The climax was reached when John Dunn eloped with Rebecca, the only child of the Davises. The young couple were forbidden their respective homes, though the farm they rented was scarce half a mile away and the weeks rolled into months without sign of their parents relenting. When Walter was born, however, the two grandmothers stole over, without their husband's knowledge, and mingled their tears in happy communion over the tiny blue-eyed mite. It was a memorable day at each of the houses when the sturdy little fellow made his way, unbidden and unattended, to pay his first call, and ever afterwards, though they would not admit it even to themselves. The grandfathers watched for his coming and vied with each other in trying to win the highest place in his young affections. He had inherited characteristics of each of his grandsires and possessed the bold, masterful manner which was common to them both. Say, Grandpa, he urged, go hunting tomorrow and try to kill a turkey for Thanksgiving, won't you? I know Grandpa, Grandma would feel better to have one, and if you make a cane collar like Papa does, I bet you can get a shot at one shore. The old man did not commit himself about going, but when Walter saw him surreptitiously take down a gun from the pegs on the wall, across which it had lain for so many years, and begin to rub the barrels and oil the hammers, he went home satisfied that he had scored another victory. Perhaps nothing less than his grandson's pleading could have induced Grandpa Harris to visit again the old hunting ground, which had been so dear to him in bygone days which was so rich in hallowed memories. It seemed almost a desecration of the happy past to hunt there now alone. The first cold streaks of dawn were just stealing into the sky the next morning when, accoutred with shot pouch, powder flask, and his old double-barrel gun, Grandpa Davis made his way toward the branch. A medley of bird notes filled the air. Long streamers of gray moss floated out from the swaying trees and showers of autumn leaves fluttered down to earth. Some of the cows were grazing outside the pen, up to their hocks in lush, fresh grass, while others lay on the ground contentedly chewing their cuds. All of them raised their heads and looked at him as he passed them by. How like the old times it was to be up at daybreak for a hunt! The long years seemed suddenly to have rolled away, leaving him once more a boy. He almost wondered why Dick had not whistled to him as he used to do. Dick was an early riser and somehow always got ready before he did. There was an alertness in the old man's face and a spring in his step as he lived over in thought the joyous days of his childhood. The clouds were flushed with pink when he came in sight of a big water oak on the margin of the stream and recollected how he and Dick had loved to go swimming in the deep, clear water beneath its shade. We used to run every step of the way, he soliloquized, laughing, unbuttoning as we went, chuck our clothes on the bank, and most break our necks trying to get to the water first. I've got half a notion to take a dip this morning if it wasn't quite so cool, he went on, but a timely twinge of rheumatism 
brought him back to his senses, and he seated himself on the roots of a convenient tree. Cocking his gun, he laid it across his knees and waited there motionless, imitating the yelp of a turkey the while. Three or four small canes graduated in size and fitted firmly into one another, enabled him to make the note, and so expert had he become by long practice that the deception was perfect. After a pause, he repeated the call. Then came another pause, another call, and over in the distance there sounded an answer. How the blood coursed through the old man's vein as, veins as he listened. There it was again. It was coming nearer, but very slowly. He wondered how many there were in the flock, and called once more. This time, to his surprise, an answer came from a different direction. A long, rasping sound, a sort of cross between a cock's crow and a turkey's yelp. He started involuntarily and very cautiously peeped around. Hardly twenty steps from him, another gray head protruded itself from the bowl of another tree, and Grandpa Davis and Grandpa Dunn looked into each other's eyes. I'll be double jumped up if that ain't Dick, cried Grandpa Davis under his breath, and there ain't a turkey as ever were a feather that he could fool. A minute more and he'll spoil the fun. Dick, he commanded, stop that racket and sneak over here by me, beckoning mysteriously. Shh, they're answering again. Down on your marrow bones whilst I call. Flattening himself upon the ground as nearly as he could and creeping behind the undergrowth, Grandpa Dunn made his way laboriously to the desired spot. He had never excelled in calling turkeys, but he was a far better shot than Grandpa Davis. Without demur, the two old boys fell naturally into the role of former days. Breathless and excited, they crouched there, waiting for the fateful moment. Their nerves were tense, their eyes dilated, their hearts beating like trip hammers. Grandpa Davis had continued to call, and now the answer was very near. Give me the first shot, Billy, whispered Grandpa Dunn. I let you do the calling, and besides, you know... You never could hit nothing that wasn't as big as the side of a meeting house. Before Grandpa Davis had time to reply, there came the put, 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 which signals possible danger. A stately gobbler raised his head to the reconnoiter. Two guns were fired almost simultaneously, and with a whirr and a flutter, the flock disappeared in the canebrake. The two old boys bounded over the intervening sticks with, and stumps, with an agility that Walter himself might have envied, and bending over the prostrate gobbler claimed in concert. Ain't he a dandy, though? They examined him critically, cutting out his beard as a trophy and measured the spread of his wings. But he's yourn, after all, Dick, said Grandpa Davis ruefully. This here ain't none of my shot, so I reckon I must have missed him. I knowed you would, Billy, afford you fired, Grandpa Dunn replied with mock gravity but that don't cut no figure. He's big enough for us to go havers and both have plenty. More than that, you done the calling anyhow. Then they laughed, and as they looked into one another's faces, each seemed to realize for the first time that his quondam chum was an old man. A moment before they had been two rollicking boys off on a lark together, playing hooky perhaps, and in the twinkling of an eye some wicked fairy had waved her wand and metamorphosed them into Walter's two grandfathers, who had not spoken to each other since years before the lad was born. Yet the humor of the situation was irresistible after all, and without knowing just how it happened, or which made the first advance, Dick and Billy found themselves still laughing until the tears coursed down their furrowed cheeks and shaking hands with as much vigor as though each one had been working a pump handle. "'I'll tell you what it is, Billy,' said Dick at last. "'You come all the way over to my house, and we'll eat them together on Thanksgiving.' "'See here, Dick,' suggested Billy, abstracting a nickel from his trousers pockets. "'Heads at your house, and tails at mine.' "'All right,' came the hearty response. Billy tossed the coin into the air, it struck a twig and hid itself among the fallen leaves, where they sought it in vain. "'Taint settled yet,' announced Dick. "'But let me tell you what let's do. 
Supposing we all go over tomorrow, it'll be Thanksgiving, you know, and eat him at John's house. Good, cried Billy with a beaming face. You always did have a head for thinking up things, Dick, and this here will sort of split the difference and ease matter so as... Yes, and our two old women can draw straws, if they've a mind to, and see which one of them is obligated to make the first call, interrupted Dick. Just heff him, old feller, urged one of them. Ain't he a whopper, though, exclaimed the other. Have a chaw, Dick, asked Billy, offering his plug of tobacco. Don't care if I do, acquiesced Dick, biting off a goodly mouthful. Seating themselves upon a fallen hickory log, they chewed and expectorated, recalling old times and enjoying their laugh with the careless freedom of their childhood days. Dick, do you recollect the fight you and a raccoon had out on the limb of that tree over yonder one night? queried Billy, nudging his companion in the ribs. He come mighty nigh getting the best of you. He tore one sleeve out of my jacket, and Mammy give me a beating besides, giggled Dick. And say, Billy, wasn't it fun the day we killed old man Lee's puddle ducks for wild ones? I don't believe I ever run as fast in my life. And, Dick, do you remember the night your pappy hung the saddle up on the head of the bed to keep you from riding the old gray mare to sing in school? And you ridder, bareback, anyway? You recollect you were stooping over, blowing the fire next morning when he seen the hairs on your breeches and come down on you with the leather, leather strop before you knowed it? Thus one adventure recalled another, and the two old boys laughed uproariously clapping their hands and holding their sides while the sun climbed up among the treetops. Ain't we been too old fools to stay mad all this time? asked one of them, and the other readily agreed that they had, as they once more grasped hands before the parting. Walter had arranged the Thanksgiving surprise for his parents, but when he brought home the big gobbler he was unable longer to keep the secret and divulged his share in what had happened. I didn't really believe either one of them could hit a turkey, he confided to his father, but I wanted to have them meet once more, for I knew if they did, they would make friends. The parlor was odorous with late fall roses next morning, the table set, and Walter and his parents in gala attire, when two couples, walking arm in arm, appeared on the stretch of white road leading up to the front gate. One couple was slightly in advance of the other, and Grandpa Davis, who was behind, whispered to his wife, Listen, Mary, Dick is actually trying to sing, and he never could turn a tune, but somehow it does warm my, up my heart to hear him. Seems like old times again. After dinner was over, and such a grand dinner it was, Grandpa Davis voiced the sentiment of the rest of the happy family party when he announced, quite without warning, well, this here has been the thankfulest Thanksgiving I ever seen, and I hope the good Lord will spare us all for a few years more. The end. Thank you so much for joining me, and have a very happy Thanksgiving.